We were at a meeting laying down the targets for 1984, when news came of Dr. Brahm Prakash's death on the evening of January 3rd at Bombay. It was a great emotional loss for me, for I had had the privilege of working under him during the most challenging period of my career. His compassion and humility were exemplary. His healing touch on the day of the failed SLVE-1 flight surfaced in my memory serving to deepen my sorrow. If Professor Sarabhai was the creator of VSSC, Dr. Brahm Prakash was the executor. He had nurtured the institution when it most needed nourishment. Dr. Brahm Prakash played a very important role in shaping my leadership skills. In fact my association with him was a turning point in my life. His humility mellowed me and helped me discard my aggressive approach. His humility did not consist merely in being modest about his talents or virtues, but in respecting the dignity of all those who worked under him and in recognizing the fact that no one is infallible, not even the leader. He was an intellectual giant with a frail constitution, he had a childlike innocence and I always considered him a saint among scientists. During this period of renaissance at DRDL, an altitude control system and an onboard computer developed by P. Bunarji, K. V. Ramanasai and their team was almost ready. The success of this effort was very vital for any indigenous missile development program. All the same, we had to have a missile to test this important system. After many brainstorming sessions, we decided to improvise a devil missile to test the system. A devil missile was disassembled, many modifications made, extensive subsystem testing was done and the missile checkout system was reconfigured. After installing a makeshift launcher, the modified and extended range devil missile was fired on June 26, 1984 to fly test the first indigenous strap-down inertial guidance system. The system met all the requirements. This was the first and very significant step in the history of Indian missile development, which had so far been restricted to reverse engineering, towards designing our own systems. A long denied opportunity was at last utilized by missile scientists at DRDL. The message was loud and clear. We could do it. It did not take long for the message to reach Delhi. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi expressed her desire to personally apprise herself of the progress of the IGMEDP. The entire organization was filled with an aura of excitement. On July 19, 1984, Srimati Gandhi visited DRDL. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was a person with a tremendous sense of pride in herself, in her work and in her country. I deemed it an honor to receive her at DRDL as she had instilled some of her own pride into my otherwise modest frame of mind. She was immensely conscious that she was the leader of 800 million people. Every step, every gesture, every movement of her hands was optimized. The esteem in which she held our work in the field of guided missiles boosted our morale immensely. During the one hour that she spent at DRDL, she covered wide-ranging aspects of the IGMEDP from flight system plans to multiple development laboratories. In the end, she addressed the 2,000-strong DRDL community. She asked for the schedules of the flight system that we were working on. When are you going to fly test Prithvi? Srimati Gandhi asked. I said, June 1987. She immediately responded, let me know what is needed to accelerate the flight schedule. She wanted scientific and technological results fast. Your fast pace of work is the hope of the entire nation, she said. She also told me that the emphasis of the IGMEDP should be not only on schedule but also on the pursuance of excellence. No matter what you achieve, you should never be completely satisfied and should always be searching for ways to prove yourself, she added. Within a month, she demonstrated her interest and support by sending the newly appointed Defense Minister, S. B. Chavan, to review our projects. Srimati Gandhi's follow-up approach was not only impressive, it was effective too. Today, everyone associated with aerospace research in our country knows that excellence is synonymous with the IGMEDP. We had our homegrown, but effective, management techniques. One such technique was concerned with follow-up of project activities. 
it basically consisted of analyzing the technical as well as procedural applicability of a possible solution, testing it with the work centers, discussing it with the general body of associates and implementing it after enlisting everybody's support. A large number of original ideas sprung up from the grassroot level of participating work centers. If you were to ask me to indicate the single most important managerial tactic in this successful program, I would point to the proactive follow-up. Through follow-up on the work done at different laboratories on design, planning, supporting services and by the inspection agencies and academic institutions, rapid progress has been achieved in the most harmonious manner. In fact, the work code in the guided missile program office was, if you need to write a letter to a work center, send a fax, if you need to send a telex or fax, telephone, and if the need arises for telephonic discussions, visit the place personally. The power of this approach came to light when Dr. Arunachalam conducted a comprehensive status review of IGMEED on September 27, 1984. Experts from DRDO laboratories, ISRO, academic institutions, and production agencies gathered to critically review the progress made and problems faced in the first year of implementation. Major decisions like the creation of facilities at Imarakancha and the establishment of a test facility were crystallized during the review. The future infrastructure at the Imarakancha was given the name of Research Center Imara. RCI retaining the original identity of the place. It was a pleasure to find an old acquaintance, T.N. Sishun, on the review board. Between SLV3 and now, we had developed a mutual affection. However, this time as the defense secretary, Sishun's queries about the schedules and viability of financial propositions presented were much more pointed. Sishun is a person who enjoys verbally bringing adversaries to their knees. Using his sharp-edged humor, Sishun would make his opponents look ridiculous. Although he is prone to be loud and can turn argumentative on occasions, in the end he would always ensure maximization of all available resources towards a solution that was within implementation. At a personal level, Sishun is a very kind-hearted and considerate person. My team was particularly pleased to answer his questions about the advanced technology employed in the IGMEDP. I still remember his uncanny curiosity about the indigenous development of carbon-carbon composites. And to let you into a small secret session. Is perhaps the only person in the world who enjoys calling me by my full name which contains 31 letters and 5 words of Ul Pakir Janyalabdin Abdul Kalam. The missile program had been pursued concurrently and had partners in design, development and production from 12 academic institutions and 30 laboratories from DRDO the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR, ISRO, and Industry. In fact, more than 50 professors and 100 research scholars worked on missile-related problems in the laboratories of their respective institutes. The quality of work achieved through this partnership in that one year had given me tremendous confidence that any development task could be undertaken within the country so long as we have our focused schedules. Four months before this review, I think it was during April, June 1984, six of us in the missile program visited academic campuses and enlisted promising young graduates. We presented an outline of the missile program before the professors and the aspiring students, about 350 of them, and requested them to participate. I informed the reviewers that we were expecting around 300 young engineers to join our laboratories. Radham Narasimha, then director of the National Aeronautical Laboratory, used the occasion of this review to put up a strong case for technology initiative. He cited the experiences of the Green Revolution, which had demonstrated beyond doubt that if the goals were clear, there was enough talent available in the country to tackle major technological challenges. When India carried out its first nuclear explosion for peaceful purposes, we declared ourselves the sixth country in the world to explode a nuclear device. When we launched SLV-3 we were the fifth country to achieve satellite launch capability. When were we going to be the first or second country in the world to achieve a technological feat? I listened carefully to the review members as they aired their opinions and doubts, and I learned from their collective wisdom. 
it was indeed a great education for me. Ironically, all through school, we were taught to read, write, and speak, but never to listen, and the situation remains much the same today. Traditionally, Indian scientists have been very good speakers, but have inadequately developed listening skills. We made a resolution to be attentive listeners. Are engineering structures not built on the foundation of functional utility? Does technical know-how not form its bricks? And, are these bricks not put together with the mortar of constructive criticism? The foundation had been laid, the bricks baked, and now the mortar to cement our act together was being mixed. We were working on the action plan that had emerged from the earlier month's review, when the news of Srimathi Gandhi's assassination broke. This was followed by the news of widespread violence and riots. A curfew had been imposed in Hyderabad city. We rolled up the PERT charts and a city map was spread out over the table to organize transport and safe passage for all employees. In less than an hour, the laboratory wore a deserted look. I was left sitting alone in my office. The circumstances of Srimathi Gandhi's death were very ominous. The memories of her visit barely three months ago further deepened my pain. Why should great people meet with such horrific ends? I recollected my father telling someone in a similar context, good and bad people live together under the sun as the black thread and the white are woven together in a cloth. When either one of the black or white thread breaks, the weaver shall look into the whole cloth, and he shall examine the loom also. When I drove out of the laboratory there was not a single soul on the road. I kept thinking about the loom of the broken thread. Srimathi Gandhi's death was a tremendous loss to the scientific community. She had given impetus to scientific research in the country. But India is a very resilient nation. It gradually absorbed the shock of Srimathi Gandhi's assassination, although at the cost of thousands of lives and a colossal loss of property. Her son, Rajiv Gandhi, took over as the new Prime Minister of India. He went to the polls and obtained a mandate from the people to carry forward the policies of Mrs. Gandhi. The integrated guided missile development program being a part of them. By the summer of 1985, all the groundwork had been completed for building the Missile Technology Research Center at Imarakansha. Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi laid the foundation stone of the Research Center Imara, RCI, on August 3, 1985. He appeared very pleased with the progress made. There was a childlike curiosity in him which was very engaging. The grit and determination displayed by his mother when she visited us a year ago was also present in him, although with a small difference. Madam Gandhi was a taskmaster, whereas Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi used his charisma to achieve his ends. He told the DRDL family that he realized the hardships faced by Indian scientists and expressed his gratitude towards those who preferred to stay back and work in their motherland rather than go abroad for comfortable careers. He said that nobody could concentrate on work of this type unless he was free from the trivialities of daily life, and assured us that whatever necessary would be done to make scientists' lives more comfortable. Within a week of his visit, I left for the USA with Dr. Arunachalam. On an invitation from the United States Air Force, Radham Narasimha, of National Aeronautical Laboratory and K.K. Gunpati of HAL accompanied us. After finishing our work at the Pentagon in Washington, we landed in San Francisco on our way to Los Angeles to visit Northrop Corporation. I utilized this opportunity to visit the Crystal Cathedral built by my favorite author, Robert Schuller. I was amazed by the sheer beauty of this all-glass, four-pointed, star-shaped structure that is more than 400 feet from one point to another. The glass roof which is 100 feet longer than a football field seemed to float in space. This cathedral has been built at the cost of several million dollars through donations organized by Schuller. God can do tremendous things through the person who doesn't care about who gets the credit. The ego involvement must go, writes Schuller. Before God trusts you with success, you have to prove yourself humble enough to handle the big prize. I prayed to God in Schuller's church to help me build a research center at the Imarakansha that would be my crystal cathedral. The young engineers, 
280 to be precise, changed the dynamics of DRDL. It was a valuable experience for all of us. We were now in a position to develop, through these young teams, a re-entry technology and structure, a millimetric wave radar, a phased array radar, rocket systems, and other such equipment. When we first assigned these tasks to the young scientists, they did not fully grasp the importance of their work. Once they did, they felt uneasy under the burden of the tremendous faith placed in them. I still remember one young man telling me, there is no big shot in our team, how will we be able to break through? I told him, a big shot is a little shot who keeps on shooting, so keep trying. It was astonishing to see how in the young scientific environment, negative attitudes changed to positive and things that were previously thought impractical began happening. Many older scientists were rejuvenated simply by being part of a young team. It has been my personal experience that the true flavor, the real fun, the continuous excitement of work lie in the process of doing it rather than in having it over and done with. To return to the four basic factors that I am convinced are involved in successful outcomes, goal setting, positive thinking, visualizing, and believing. By now, we had gone through an elaborate exercise of goal setting and enthused the young scientists about these goals. At the review meetings, I would insist that the youngest scientists present their team's work. That would help them in visualizing the whole system. Gradually, an atmosphere of confidence grew. Young scientists started questioning senior colleagues on solid technical issues. Nothing daunted them, because they feared nothing. If there were doubts, they rose above them. They soon became persons of power. A person with belief never grovels before anyone, whining and whimpering that it's all too much, that he lacks support, that he is being treated unfairly. Instead, such a person tackles problems head on and then affirms, as a child of God, I am greater than anything that can happen to me. I tried to keep the work environment lively with a good blend of the experience of the older scientists mixed with the skills of their younger colleagues. This positive dependence between youth and experience had created a very productive work culture at DRDL. The first launch of the missile program was conducted on September 16, 1985, when Trishul took off from the test range at Shrihrikota, Shar. It was a ballistic flight meant for testing the in-flight performance of the solid propellant rocket motor. Two C-band radars and Kaladio Theodolite, KTLs, were used to track the missile from the ground. The test was successful. The launcher, rocket motor, and telemetry systems functioned as planned. The aerodynamic drag however was higher than the estimates predicted on the basis of wind tunnel testing. In terms of technology breakthrough or experience enrichment, this test was of little value but the real achievement of this test was to remind my DRDL friends that they could fly missiles without being driven by the brute demands of compliance or reverse engineering. In a swift stroke, the psyche of the DRDL scientists experienced a multi-dimensional expansion. This was followed by the successful test flight of the pilotless target aircraft, PDA. Our engineers had developed the rocket motor for the PDA designed by the Bangalore-based Aeronautical Development Establishment, AID. The motor had been type approved by DTDNP, AIR. This was a small but significant step towards developing missile hardware that is not only functional but also acceptable to the user agencies. A private sector firm was engaged to produce a reliable, airworthy, high thrust-to-weight ratio rocket motor with technology input. From DRDL. We were slowly graduating from single laboratory projects to multi laboratory programs to laboratory industry exercises. The development of PDA symbolized a great confluence of four different organizations. I felt as if I was standing at a meeting point and looking at the roads coming from AID, DTDNP, AIR, and ISRO. The fourth road was the DRDL a highway to national self-reliance in missile technology. Taking our partnership with the academic institutions of the country a step further, joint advanced technology programs were started at the Indian Institute of Science, IISC, and Yadavpur University. I have always had a deep regard for academic institutions and reverence for excellent academicians. 
I value the inputs that academicians can make. To development. Formal requests had been placed with these institutions and arrangements arrived at under which expertise from their faculties would be extended to DRDL in pursuance of its projects. Let me highlight a few contributions of academic institutions to the various missile systems. Prithvi had been designed as an inertially guided missile. To reach the target accurately, the trajectory parameters have to be loaded into its brain and onboard computer. A team of young engineering graduates at Yadavpur University under the guidance of Professor Goshal developed the required robust guidance algorithm. At the IISC, postgraduate students under the leadership of Professor I.G. Sharma developed air defense software for multi-target acquisition by Akash. The re-entry vehicle system design methodology for Agni was developed by a young team at IIT Madras and DRDO scientists. Osmania University's Navigational Electronics Research and Training Unit had developed state-of-the-art signal processing algorithms for NAG. I have only given a few examples of collaborative endeavor. In fact, it would have been very difficult to achieve our advanced technological goals without the active partnership of our academic institutions. Let us consider the example of the Agni payload breakthrough. Agni is a two-stage rocket system and employs re-entry technology developed in the country for the first time. It is boosted by a first-stage solid rocket motor derived from SLV-3 and further accelerated at the second stage with the liquid rocket engines of Prithvi. For the Agni, the payload gets delivered at hypersonic speeds, which calls for the design and development of a re-entry vehicle structure. The payload with guidance electronics is housed in the re-entry vehicle structure, which is meant to protect the payload by keeping the inside temperature within the limit of 40 OC, when the outside skin temperature is greater than 2500 OC. An inertial guidance system with an onboard computer guides the payload to the required target. For any re-entry missile system, three-dimensional preforms are core material for making the carbon-carbon nose tip that will remain strong even at such high temperatures. Four laboratories of DRDO and the CSIR achieved this in a short span of 18 months something other countries could do only after a decade of research and development. Another challenge involved in the Agni payload design was related to the tremendous speed with which it would re-enter the atmosphere. In fact, Agni would re-enter the atmosphere at 12 times the speed of sound, 12 Mach, as we call it in science. At this tremendous speed, we had no experience of how to keep the vehicle under control. To carry out a test, we had no wind tunnel to generate that kind of speed. If we sought American help, we would have been seen as aspiring to something they considered their exclusive privilege. Even if they consented to cooperate, they would be certain to quote a price for their wind tunnel greater than our entire project budget. Now, the question was how to beat the system. Professor S. M. Deshpande of the IISC found four young, bright scientists working in the field of fluid dynamics and, within six months, developed the software for computational fluid dynamics for hypersonic regimes, which is one of its kind in the world. Another achievement was the development of a missile trajectory simulation software, Anakalpana by Professor I. G. Sharma of IISC to evaluate multi target acquisition capabilities of an Akash type weapon system. No country would have given us this kind of software, but we developed it indigenously. In yet another example of creating a synergy of scientific talent, Professor Bardi Bud of IIT Delhi, working with the Solid Physics Laboratory, SPL, and Central Electronics Limited, CEL, broke the monopoly of the Western countries by developing ferrite phase shifters for use in the multifunction, multitasking 3D phased army radar 4. Surveillance, Tracking and Guidance of Akash Professor Saraf of IIT, Kutgapur, working with B.K. Mukhopadhyay, I, my colleague at RCI, made a millimetric wave, MMW, antenna for the NAG seeker head in two years, a record even by international standards. The Central Electrical and Electronics Research Institute, CIRI, Pilani developed an impact diode in consortium with the SPL and RCI to overcome technological foreign dependence in creating these components, which are the heart of any MMW device. As work on the project spread horizontally, 
performance appraisal became more and more difficult. DRDO has an assessment linked policy. Leading nearly 500 scientists, I had to finalize their performance appraisals in the form of annual confidential reports, ACRS. These reports would be forwarded to an assessment board comprised of outside specialists for recommendations. Many people viewed this part of my job uncharitably. Missing a promotion was conveniently translated as a dislike I had towards them. Promotions of other colleagues were seen as subjective favors granted by me. Entrusted with the task of performance evaluation, I had to be a fair judge. To truly understand a judge, you must understand the riddle of the scales, one side heaped high with hope, the other side holding apprehension. When the scales dip, bright optimism turns into silent panic. When a person looks at himself, he is likely to misjudge what he finds. He sees only his intentions. Most people have good intentions and hence conclude that whatever they are doing is good. It is difficult for an individual to objectively judge his actions, which may be, and often are, contradictory to his good intentions. Most people come to work with the intention of doing it. Many of them do their work in a manner they find convenient and leave for home in the evening with a sense of satisfaction. They do not evaluate their performance, only their intentions. It is assumed that because an individual has worked with the intention of finishing his work in time, if delays occurred, they were due to reasons beyond his control. He had no intention of causing the delay. But if his action or inaction caused that delay, was it not intentional? Looking back on my days as a young scientist, I am aware that one of the most constant and powerful urges I experienced was my desire to be more than what I was at that moment. I desired to feel more, learn more, express more. I desired to grow, improve, purify, expand. I never used any outside influence to advance my career. All I had was the inner urge to seek more within myself. The key to my motivation has always been to look at how far I had still to go rather than how far I had come. After all, what is life but a mixture of unsolved problems, ambiguous victories, and amorphous defeats? The trouble is that we often merely analyze life instead of dealing with it. People dissect their failures for causes and effects, but seldom deal with them and gain experience to master them and thereby avoid their recurrence. This is my belief, that through difficulties and problems God gives us the opportunity to grow. So when your hopes and dreams and goals are dashed, search among the wreckage, you may find a golden opportunity hidden in the ruins. To motivate people to enhance their performance and deal with depression is always a challenge for a leader. I have observed an analogy between a force field equilibrium and resistance to change in organizations. Let us imagine change to be a coiled spring in a field of opposing forces, such that some forces support change and others resist. It By increasing the supportive forces such as supervisory pressure, prospects of career growth and monetary benefits or decreasing the resisting forces such as group norms, social rewards, and work avoidance, the situation can be directed towards the desired result but for a short time only, and that too only to a certain extent. After a while the resisting forces push back with greater force as they are compressed even more tightly. Therefore, a better approach would be to decrease the resisting force in such a manner that there is no concomitant increase in the supporting forces. In this way, less energy will be needed to bring about and maintain change. The result of the forces I mentioned above, is motive. It is a force which is internal to the individual and forms the basis of his behavior in the work environment. In my experience, most people possess a strong inner drive for growth, competence, and self-actualization. The problem, however, has been the lack of a work environment that stimulates and permits them to give full expression to this drive. Leaders can create a high productivity level by providing the appropriate organizational structure and job design, and by acknowledging and appreciating hard work. I first attempted to build up such a supportive environment in 1983, while launching IGMEDP. The projects were in the design phase at that time. 
the reorganization resulted in at least 40% to 50% increase in the level of activity. Now that the multiple projects were entering into the development and flight testing stage, the major and minor milestones reached gave the program visibility and continuous commitment. With the absorption of a young team of scientists, the average age had been brought down from 42 to 33 years. I felt it was time for a second reorganization. But how should I go about it? I took stock of the motivational inventory available at that time let me explain to you what I mean by this term. The motivational inventory of a leader is made up of three types of understanding, an understanding of the needs that people expect to satisfy in their jobs, an understanding of the effect that job design has on motivation, and an understanding of the power of positive reinforcement in influencing people's behavior. The 1983 reorganization was done with the objective of renewal, it was indeed a very complex exercise handled deftly by A.V. Rangarao and C.O.L.R. Swaminathan. We created a team of newly joined young scientists with just one experienced person and gave them the challenge of building the strap-down inertial guidance system, an onboard computer and a ram rocket in propulsion system. These exercises were being attempted for the first time in the country, and the technology involved was comparable with world-class systems. The guidance technology is centered around a gyro and accelerometer package, and electronics, to process the sensor output. The onboard computer carries the mission computations and flight sequencing. A ram rocket system breathes air to sustain its high velocity for long durations after it is put through a booster rocket. The young teams not only designed these systems but also developed them into operational equipment. Later Prithvi and then Agni used similar guidance systems, with excellent results. The effort of these young teams made the country self-reliant in the area of protected technologies. It was a good demonstration of the renewal factor. Our intellectual capacity was renewed through contact with enthusiastic young minds and had achieved these outstanding results. Now, besides the renewal of manpower, emphasis had to be laid on augmenting the strength of project groups. Often people seek to satisfy their social, egoistic, and self-actualization needs at their workplaces. A good leader must identify two different sets of environmental features. One, which satisfies a person's needs and the other, which creates dissatisfaction with his work. We have already observed that people look for those characteristics in their work that relate to the values and goals which they consider important as giving meaning to their lives. If a job meets the employee's need for achievement, recognition, responsibility, growth, and advancement, they will work hard to achieve goals. Once the work is satisfying, a person then looks at the environment and circumstances in the workplace. He observes the policies of the administration, qualities of his leader, security, status, and working conditions. Then, he correlates these factors to the interpersonal relations he has with his peers and examines his personal life in the light of these factors. It is the agglomerate of all these aspects that decides the degree and quality of a person's effort and performance. The Matrix organization evolved in 1983 proved excellent in meeting all these requirements. So, while retaining the structure of the laboratory, we undertook a task design exercise. The scientists working in technology directorates were made system managers to interact exclusively with one project. An external fabrication wing was formed under P.K. Biswas, a developmental fabrication technologist of long standing, to deal with the public sector undertakings, PSUs, and private sector firms associated with the development of the missile hardware. This reduced pressure on the in-house fabrication facilities and enabled them to concentrate on jobs which could not be undertaken outside. Which in fact occupied all the three shifts. Work on Prithvi was nearing completion when we entered 1988. For the first time in the country, clustered liquid propellant, LP, rocket engines with programmable total impulse were going to be used in a missile system to attain flexibility in payload range combination. Now. Besides the scope and quality of the policy decisions Sundaram and I were providing to the Prithvi team, 
The project's success depended on creative ideas being converted into workable products and the quality and thoroughness of the team members' contribution. Sarasvat with Vigyaneshwar and P. Venugopalan did a commendable job in this regard. They instilled in their team a sense of pride and achievement. The importance of these rocket engines was not restricted to the Prithvi project it was a national achievement. Under their collective leadership, a large number of engineers and technicians understood and committed themselves to the team goals, as well as the specific goals which each one of them was committed to accomplish personally. Their entire team worked under a self-evident sort of direction. Working together with the Ordnance Factory, Kirky, they also completely eliminated the import content in the propellant for these engines. Leaving the vehicle development in the safe and efficient hands of Sundaram and Sarasvat, I started looking at the mission's vulnerable areas. Meticulous planning had gone into the development of the launch release mechanism, LRM, for the smooth liftoff of the missile. The joint development of explosive bolts to hold the LRM prior to the launch by DRDL and Explosive Research and Development Laboratory. ERDL, was an excellent example of multi-work center coordination. While flying, drifting into spells of contemplation and looking down at the landscape below has always been my favorite preoccupation. It is so beautiful, so harmonious, so peaceful from a distance that I wonder where all those boundaries are which separate district from district, state from state, and country from country. Maybe such a sense of distance and detachment is required in dealing with all the activities of our life. Since the interim test range at Balasower was still at least a year away from completion, we had set up special facilities at Char for the launch of Prithvi. These included a launch pad, blockhouse, control consoles and mobile telemetry stations. I had a happy reunion with my old friend Mr. Kurup who was the director, Char Center by then. Working with Kurup on the Prithvi launch campaign gave me great satisfaction. Kurup worked for Prithvi as a team member, ignoring the boundary lines that divide DRDO and ISRO, DRDL, and SHAR. Kurup used to spend a lot of time with us at the launch pad. He complimented us with his experience in range testing and range safety and worked with great enthusiasm in propellant filling, making the maiden Prithvi launch campaign a memorable experience. Prithvi was launched at 11.23 HRS on February 25, 1988. It was an epic-making event in the history of rocketry in the country. Prithvi was not merely a surface-to-surface -surface missile with the capability of delivering a 1,000 kg conventional warhead to a distance of 150 km with an accuracy of 50 m sep, it was in fact the basic module for all future guided missiles in the country. It already had the provision for modification from a long-range surface to an air missile system, and could also be deployed on a ship. The accuracy of a missile is expressed in terms of its circular error probable, SEP. This measures the radius of a circle within which 50% of the missiles fired will impact. In other words, if a missile has a SEP of 1 km, such as the Iraqi Scud missiles fired in the Gulf War, this means that half of them should impact within one kilometer of their target. A missile with a conventional high-explosive warhead and a SEP of one kilometer would not normally be expected to destroy or disable fixed military targets such as a command and control facility or an air base. It would however be effective against an undefined target such as a city. The German V-2 missiles fired at London between September 1944 and March 1945 had a conventional high-explosive warhead and a very large SEP of some 17 kilometers. Yet the 500 V-2S which hit London succeeded in causing more than 21,000 casualties and destroying about 200,000 homes. When the West were crying themselves hoarse over the NPT, we stressed upon building competence in core guidance and control technologies to achieve a SEP as precise as 50M. With the success of the Prithvi trials, the cold reality of a possible strategic strike even without a nuclear warhead had silenced the critics to whispers about a possible technology conspiracy theory. The launch of Prithvi sent shockwaves across the unfriendly neighboring countries. The response of the Western Bloc was initially one of shock and then of anger. A seven-nation technology embargo was clamped, 
making it impossible for India to buy anything even remotely connected with the development of guided missiles. The emergence of India as a self-reliant country in the field of guided missiles upset all the developed nations of the world. Indian core competence in rocketry has been firmly established again, beyond any doubt. The robust civilian space industry and viable missile-based defenses has brought India into the select club of nations that call themselves superpowers. Always encouraged to follow Buddha's or Gandhi's teachings, how and why did India become a missile power is a question that needs to be answered for future generations. Two centuries of subjugation, oppression, and denial have failed to kill the creativity and capability of the Indian people. Within just a decade of gaining independence and achieving sovereignty, Indian space and atomic energy programs were launched with a perfect orientation towards peaceful applications. There were neither funds for investing in missile development nor any established requirement from the armed forces. The bitter experiences of 1962 forced us to take the basic first steps towards missile development. Would a Prithvi suffice? Would the indigenous development of four or five missile systems make us sufficiently strong? Or would having nuclear weapons make us stronger? Missiles and atomic weapons are merely parts of a greater whole. As I saw it, the development of Prithvi represented the self-reliance of our country in the field of advanced technology. High technology is synonymous with huge amounts of money and massive infrastructure. Neither of these was available, unfortunately inadequate measure. So what could we do? Perhaps the Agni missile being developed as a technology demonstrator project, pooling all the resources available in the country, could provide an answer? I was very sure, even when we discussed Rex in ISRO about a decade ago, that Indian scientists and technologists working together had the capability to achieve this technological breakthrough. India can most certainly achieve state-of-the-art technology through a combined effort of the scientific laboratories and the academic institutions. If one can liberate Indian industry from the self-created image of being mere fabricating factories, they can implement indigenously developed technology and attain excellent results. To do this, we adopted a three-fold strategy multi-institutional participation, the consortium approach, and the empowering technology. These were the stones rubbed together to create Agni. The Agni team was comprised of more than 500 scientists. Many organizations were networked to undertake this huge effort of launching Agni. The Agni mission had two basic orientations work and workers. Each member was dependent on the others in his team to accomplish his target. Contradiction and confusion are the two things most likely to occur in such situations. Different leaders accommodate concern for workers while getting work done, in their own personal ways. Some shed all concern for workers in order to get results. They use people merely as instruments to reach goals. Some give less importance to the work, and make an effort to gain the warmth and approval of people working with them. But what this team achieved was the highest possible integration in terms of both the quality of work and human relationships. Involvement, participation, and commitment were the key words to functioning. Each of the team members appeared to be performing by choice. The launching of Agni was the common stake not only for our scientists, but for their families too. V. R. Nagraj was the leader of the electrical integration team. Dedicated technologist that he is, Nagraj would forget basic requirements like food and sleep while on the integration gig. His brother-in-law passed away while he was at ITR. His family kept this information from Nagraj so that there would be no interruption in his work towards the launching of Agni. The Agni launch had been scheduled for April 20, 1989. This was going to be an unprecedented exercise. Unlike space launch vehicles, a missile launch involves wide-ranging safety hazards. Two radars, three telemetry stations, one telecommand station and four electro-optical tracking instruments to monitor the missile trajectory had been deployed. In addition, the telemetry station at Kar Nicobar, Istrak, and the Shar radars were also commissioned to track the vehicle. Dynamic surveillance was employed to cover the electrical power that flows from the missile batteries within the vehicle and to control system pressures. Should any deviation be noticed either in voltage or in pressure, 
the specially designed automatic checkout system would signal hold. The flight operations would then be sequenced only if the defect was rectified. The countdown for the launch started at T36 hours. The countdown from T7.5 minutes was to be computer controlled. All activities preparatory to the launch went according to schedule. We had decided to move the people living in nearby villages to safety at the time of the launch. This attracted media attention, and led to much controversy. By the time April 20, 1989 arrived, the whole nation was watching us. Foreign pressure was exerted through diplomatic channels to abort the flight trial, but the Indian government stood behind us like a rock and staved off any distraction to our work. We were at T14 seconds when the computer signaled hold, indicating that one of the instruments was functioning erratically. This was immediately rectified. Meanwhile, the downrange station asked for a hold. In another few seconds, multiple holds were necessitated, resulting in irreversible internal power consumption. We had to abort the launch. The missile had to be opened up to replace the onboard power supplies. A weeping Nagraj, by now informed about the tragedy in his family, met me and promised that he would be back within three days. The profiles of these courageous people will never be written about in any history book, but it is such silent people on whose hard work generations thrive and nations progress. Sending Nagraj off, I met my team members who were in a state of shock and sorrow. I shared my SLV-3 experience with them. I lost my launch vehicle in the sea but recovered successfully. Your missile is in front of you. In fact you have lost nothing but a few weeks of rework. This shook them out of their immobility and the entire team went back to retrieve the subsystems and recharge them. The press was up in arms, and fielded various interpretations of the postponement of the flight to suit the fancies of their readership. Cartoonist Sudhir D.A.R. sketched a shopkeeper returning a product to the salesman saying that like Agni it would not take off. Another cartoonist showed one Agni scientist explaining that the launch was postponed because the press button did not make contact. The Hindustan Times showed a leader consoling press reporters, there's no need for any alarm, it's a purely peaceful, nonviolent missile. After a detailed analysis conducted virtually around the clock for the next 10 days, our scientists had the missile ready for launch on May 1, 1989. But, again, during the automatic computer checkout period at T10 seconds, a hold signal was indicated. A closer inspection showed that one of the control components, S1 TVC was not working according to the mission requirements. The launch had to be postponed yet again. Now, such things are very common in rocketry and quite often happen in other countries too. But the expectant nation was in no mood to appreciate our difficulties. The Hindu carried a cartoon by Keshav showing a villager counting some currency notes and commenting to another, yes, it's the compensation for moving away from my hut near the test site a few more postponements and I can build a house of my own. Another cartoonist designated Agni as IDBM intermittently delayed ballistic missile. Amal's cartoon suggested that what Agni needed to do was use their butter as fuel. I took some time off, leaving my team at ITR to talk to the DRDLRCI community. The entire DRDLRCI community assembled after working hours on May 8, 1989. I addressed the gathering of more than 2,000 persons, very rarely is a laboratory or an R&D establishment given an opportunity to be the first in the country to develop a system such as Agni. A great opportunity has been given to us. Naturally major opportunities are accompanied by equally major challenges. We should not give up and we should not allow the problem to defeat us. The country doesn't deserve anything less than success from us. Let us aim for success. I had almost completed my address, when I found myself telling my people, I promise you, we will be back after successfully launching Agni before the end of this month. Detailed analysis of the component failure during the second attempt led to the refurbishment of the control system. This task was entrusted to a DRDOISRO team. The team carried out the rectification of the first stage control system at the liquid propellant system complex. 
LPSC, of ISRO and completed the task in record time with tremendous concentration and willpower. It was nothing short of amazing how hundreds of scientists and staff worked continuously and completed the system readiness with acceptance tests in just 10 days. The aircraft took off from Trivandrum with the rectified control systems and landed close to ITR on the 11th day. But now it was the turn of hostile weather conditions to impede us. A cyclone threat was looming large. All the work centers were connected through satellite communication and HF links. Meteorological data started flowing in at 10-minute intervals. Finally, the launch was scheduled for May 22, 1989. The previous night, Dr. Arunachalam, Jen K. N. Singh and I were walking together. With the Defense Minister K. C. Pant, who had come to ITR to witness. The launch. It was a full moon night, it was high tide and the waves crashed and roared, as if singing of his glory and power. Would we succeed with the Agni launch tomorrow? This question was foremost in all our minds, but none of us was willing to break the spell cast by the beautiful moonlit night. Breaking a long silence, the defense minister finally asked me, Callum, what would you like me to do to celebrate the Agni success tomorrow? It was a simple question, to which I could not think of an answer immediately. What did I want? What was it that I did not have? What could make me happier? And then I found the answer. We need 100,000 saplings to plant at RCI, I said. His face lit up with a friendly glow. You are buying the blessings of Mother Earth for Agni, Defense Minister K.C. Pant quipped. We will succeed tomorrow, he predicted. The next day Agni took off at 0710 HRS. It was a perfect launch. The missile followed a textbook trajectory. All flight parameters were met. It was like waking up to a beautiful morning from a nightmarish sleep. We had reached the launch pad after five years of continuous work at multiple work centers. We had lived through the ordeal of a series of snags in the last five weeks. We had survived pressure from everywhere to stop the whole thing. But we did it at last. It was one of the greatest moments of my life. A mere 600 seconds of elegant flight washed off our entire fatigue in an instant. What a wonderful culmination of our years of labor. I wrote in my diary that night. Zero O oh not look at Agni. As an entity directed upward to deter the ominous. Or exhibit your might. It is fire. In the heart of an Indian. Do not even give it. The form of a missile as it clings to the burning pride of this nation and thus is bright. Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi called the Agni launch a major achievement in our continuing efforts to safeguard our independence and security by self-reliant means. The technology demonstration through Agni is a reflection of our commitment to the indigenous development of advanced technologies for the nation's defense. The country is proud of your efforts, he told me. President Venkatraman saw in the Agni success the fulfillment of his dream. He cabled from Simla, it is a tribute to your dedication, hard work, and talent. A great deal of misinformation and disinformation had been spread by vested interests about this technology mission. Agni had never been intended only as a nuclear weapons system. What it did was to afford us the option of developing the ability to deliver non-nuclear weapons with high precision at long ranges. That it provided us with a viable non-nuclear option was of the greatest relevance to contemporary strategic doctrines. Great ire was raised by the test firing of Agni, according to a well-known American defense journal, especially in the United States where congressmen threatened to put a stop to all dual-use and missile-related technologies, along with all multinational aid. Gary Milholland, a so-called specialist in missiles and warhead technologies, had made a claim in the Wall Street Journal that India had made Agni with the help of West Germany. I had a hearty laugh reading that the German Aerospace Research Establishment, DLR, had developed Agni's guidance system, the first stage rocket, and a composite nose cone, and that the aerodynamic model of Agni was tested in the DLR wind tunnel. An immediate denial came from the DLR, who in 
Turn speculated that France had supplied the Agni guidance electronics. American Senator Jeff Bingaman even went to the extent of suggesting that I picked up everything needed for Agni during my four-month stay at Wallops Island in 1962. The fact that I was in Wallops Island more than 25 years ago and at that time the technology used in Agni did not exist even in the United States was not mentioned. In today's world, technological backwardness leads to subjugation. Can we allow our freedom to be compromised on this account? It is our bounden duty to guarantee the security and integrity of our nation against this threat. Should we not uphold the mandate bequeathed to us by our forefathers who fought for the liberation of our country from imperialism, only when we are technologically self-reliant will we able to fulfill their dream. Till the Agni launch, the Indian armed forces had been structured for a strictly defensive role to safeguard our nation, to shield our democratic processes from the turbulence in the countries around us and to raise the cost of any external intervention to an unacceptable level for countries which may entertain such notions. With Agni, India had reached the stage where she had the option of preventing wars involving her. Agni marked the completion of five years of IGMEDP. Now that it had demonstrated our competence in the crucial area of re-entry technology and with tactical missiles like Prithvi and Trishal already test-fired, the launches of NAG and Akash would take us into areas of competence where there is little or no international competition. These two missile systems contained within themselves the stuff of major technological breakthroughs. There was a need to focus our efforts more intensively on them. In September 1989, I was invited by the Maharashtra Academy of Sciences in Bombay to deliver the Jawaharlal Nehru Memorial Lecture. I used this opportunity to share with the budding scientists my plans of making an indigenous air-to-air -air missile, Astra. It would dovetail with the development of the Indian Light Combat Aircraft, LCA. I told them that our work in imaging infrared, IIR, and millimetric wave, MMW, radar technology for the NAG missile system had placed us in the vanguard of international R&D efforts in missile technology. I also drew their attention to the crucial role that carbon-carbon and other advanced composite materials play in mastering the re-entry technology. Agni was the conclusion of a technological effort that was given its start by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi when the country decided to break free from the paralysing fetters of technological backwardness and slough off the dead skin of subordination to industrialized nations. The second flight of Prithvi at the end of September 1988 was again a great success. Prithvi has proved to be the best surface-to-surface -surface missile in the world today. It can carry 1,000 kilograms of warhead to a distance of 250 kilometers and deliver it within a radius of 50 meters. Through computer-controlled operations, numerous warhead weight and delivery distance combinations can be achieved in a very short time and in battlefield conditions. It is 100% indigenous in all respects design, operations, deployment. It can be produced in large numbers as the production facilities at BDL were concurrently developed during the development phase itself. The Army was quick to recognize the potential of this commendable effort and approached the CCPA for placing orders for Prithvi and Trishal missile systems, something that had never happened before. On Republic Day 1990, the nation celebrated the success of its missile program. I was conferred the Padma Vibhushan along with Dr. Arunachalam. Two of my other colleagues J.C. Bhattacharya and R.N. Agarwal were also decorated with the Padma Shri Awards. It was the first time in the history of Free India that so many scientists affiliated to the same organization found their names on the awards list. Memories of the Padma Bhushan awarded a decade. A go came alive. I still lived more or less as I had lived then in a room 10 feet wide and 12 feet long, furnished mainly with books, papers, and a few pieces of hired furniture. The only difference was at that time, my room was in Trivandrum and now it was in Hyderabad. The mess bearer brought me my breakfast of idlies and buttermilk and smiled in silent congratulation for the award. I was touched by the recognition bestowed on me by my countrymen. 
A large number of scientists and engineers leave this country at their first opportunity to earn more money abroad. It is true that they definitely get greater monetary benefits, but could anything compensate for this love and respect from one's own countrymen? I sat alone for a while in silent contemplation. The sand and shells of Ramaswaram, the care of Iyadurai Solomon in Ramanathapuram, the guidance of Rev. Father Sequeira in Triki and Professor Pandalai in Madras, the encouragement of Dr. Medirata in Bangalore, the hovercraft ride with Professor Mainon, the pre-dawn visit to the Tulpat Range with Professor Sarabhai, the healing touch of Dr. Brahm Prakash on the day of the SLV-3 failure, the national jubilation on the SLV-3 launch, Madame Gandhi's appreciative smile, the post-SLV-3 simmering at VSSC, Dr. Raymond's faith in inviting me to DRDO, the Igmeep, the creation of RCI, Prithvi, Agni, a flood of memories. Swept over me. Where were all these men now? My father, Professor Sarabhai, Dr. Brahm Prakash? I wished I could meet them and share my joy with them. I felt the paternal forces of heaven and the maternal and cosmic forces of nature embrace me as parents would hug their long-lost child. I scribbled in my diary. Away. Fond thoughts, and vex my soul no more, work claimed my wakeful nights, my busy days albeit brought memories of Ramaswaram sure yet haunt my dreaming gaze. A fortnight later, Ayur and his team celebrated the awards for the missile program with the maiden flight of Nag. They repeated the feat again on the very next day, thus testing twice over the first Indian all-composite airframe and the propulsion system. These tests also proved the worth of the indigenous thermal batteries. India had achieved the status of having a third-generation anti-tank missile system with fire-and-forget capability on PAR with any state-of-the-art technology in the world. Indigenous composite technology had achieved a major milestone. The success of NAG also confirmed the efficacy of the consortium approach, which had led to the successful development of Agni. NAG uses two key technologies an imaging infrared, IIR, system and a millimetric wave, MMW, seeker radar as its guiding eye. No single laboratory in the country possessed the capability of developing these highly advanced systems. But the urge to succeed existed, which resulted in a very effective joint effort. The semiconductor complex at Chandigarh developed the charge coupled devices, CCD, array. The Solid Physics Laboratory, Delhi, made the matching mercury cadmium telluride, MCT, detectors. The Defense Science Center, DSC, Delhi, put together an indigenous cooling system based on the Jarls Thomson effect. The transmitter receiver front end was devised at the Defense Electronics Application Laboratory, Deal, Dehradun. The special gallium arsenide gun, Scottky Barrier Mixer Diodes, Compact Comparator for Antenna System India was banned from buying any one of these high technology devices, but innovation cannot be suppressed by international restrictions. I went to Mata Rai Kamaraj University the same month to deliver their convocation address. When I reached Madurai, I asked after my high school teacher Iyadure Solomon, who was by now a reverend and 80 years old. I was told that he lived in a suburb of Madurai, so I took a taxi and looked for his house. Rev. Solomon knew that I was going to give the convocation address that day. However, he had no way of getting there. There was a touching reunion between teacher and pupil. Dr. P. C. Alexander, the governor of Tamil Nadu, who was presiding over the function, was deeply moved on seeing the elderly teacher who had not forgotten his pupil of long ago, and requested him to share the dais. Every convocation day of every university is like opening the floodgates of energy which, once harnessed by institutions, organizations, and industry, aids in nation building, I told the young graduates. Somehow I felt I was echoing Rev. Solomon's words, spoken about half a century ago. After my lecture, I bowed down before my teacher. Great dreams. Of great dreamers are always transcended, I told Rev. Solomon. You have not only reached my goals, Callum. You have eclipsed them, he. 
told me in a voice choked with emotion. The next month, I happened to be in Tricky and used that opportunity to visit St. Joseph's College. I did not find Rev. Father Sequeira, Rev. Father Erhart, Professor Subramanyam, Professor Iyampirimulkonar, or Professor Thothathri Iyengar there, but it seemed to me that the stones of the St. Joseph's building still carried the imprint of the wisdom of those great people. I shared with the young students my memories of St. Joseph's and paid tribute to the teachers who had molded me. We celebrated the nation's 44th Independence Day with the test firing of Akash. Prahlada and his team evaluated a new solid propellant booster system based on a composite modified double base propellant. This propellant with its unprecedented high-energy properties was crucial in assuring the long-range surface-to-air missiles. The country had taken an important step in ground-based air defense of vulnerable areas. Towards the end of 1990, Yadavpur University conferred on me the honor of Doctor of Science at a special convocation. I was a little embarrassed at finding my name mentioned along with that of the legendary Nelson Mandela, who was also honored at the same convocation. What could I possible have in common with a legend like Mandela? Perhaps it was our persistence in our missions. My mission of advancing rocketry in my country was perhaps nothing when compared with Mandela's mission of achieving dignity for a great mass of humanity, but there was no difference in the intensity of our passions. Be more dedicated to making solid achievements than in running after swift but synthetic happiness, was my advice to the young audience. The Missile Council declared 1991 the year of initiative for DRDL and RCI. When we chose the route of concurrent engineering in IGMEED, we selected a rough track. With the completion of developmental trials. On Prithvi and Trishal, our choice was on test now. I exhorted my colleagues to commence user trials within the year. I knew that it was going to be a tough task, but that was not going to discourage us. Rear Admiral Mohan retired and his deputy, Kapoor, was to take over Trishal. I had always admired Mohan's understanding of missile command guidance. This sailor teacher scientist could outweet any other expert in the country in this field. I will always remember his candid exposition of various aspects of the command line of sight, class, guidance system during the Trishal meetings. Once, he showed me a verse that he had composed to highlight the woes of an IGMEED project director. It was a good way of letting off steam. Impossible time frames. Pert charts to boot. Are driving me almost crazy as a coot, presentations to MC add to one's woes. If they solve anything, heaven only knows. Meetings on holidays, even at night. The family is fed up. And all ready to fight. My hands are itching. To tear my hair. But alas. I haven't any more to tear. I told him, I have handed over all my problems to my best teams in DRDL, RCI and other participating labs. That has given me a full head. Of hair. The year 1991 began on a very ominous note. On the night of January 15, 1991, the Gulf War broke out between Iraq and the Allied forces. Led by the USA. In one stroke, thanks to satellite television invading. Indian skies by that time, rockets and missiles captured the imagination. Of the entire nation. People started discussing scuds and patriots in coffee houses and tea shops. Children began flying paper kites shaped like. Missiles and playing war games along the lines of what they saw on American television networks. The successful test firing of Prithvi and Trishal during the course of the Gulf War was enough to make an anxious nation relax. The newspaper reports of the programmable trajectory capability of the Prithvi and Trishal guidance system, using microwave frequencies in virtually unjammable bands, created widespread awareness. The nation was quick to draw parallels between the missiles operational in the Gulf War and our own warhead carriers. A common query I encountered was whether Prithvi was superior to a Scud, whether Akash could perform like a Patriot, and so on. Hearing a yes or a why not, from me, 
people's faces would light up with pride and satisfaction. The Allied forces had a marked technological edge, as they were. Fielding systems built using the technologies of the 80s and 90s. Iraq was fighting with the by and large vintage weapon systems of the 60s and 70s. Now, this is where the key to the modern world order lies superiority through technology. Deprive the opponent of the latest technology and then dictate your terms in an unequal contest. When the Chinese war philosopher Sun Tzu ruminated over 2,000 years ago that what matters in war is not decimating the enemy army physically but breaking his will so as to make him concede defeat in the mind, he seems to have visualized the domination of technology in the 20th century theaters of war. The missile force coupled with the electronic warfare used in the Gulf War was a feast for military strategic experts. It acted as a curtain razor for the 21st century war scenario with missiles and electronic and information warfare playing the lead roles. In India, even today, the term technology, for most people, conjures up images of smoky steel mills or clanking machines. This is a rather inadequate conception of what technology denotes. The invention of the horse collar in the Middle Ages led to major changes in agricultural methods, and was as much a technological advance as the invention of the Bessemer furnace centuries later. Moreover, technology includes techniques as well as the machines that may or may not be necessary to apply them. It includes ways to make chemical reactions occur, ways to breed fish, eradicate weeds, light theaters, treat patients, teach history, fight wars, or even prevent them. Today, most advanced technological processes are carried out far from assembly lines or open hearths. Indeed, in electronics, in space technology, in most of the new industries, relative silence and clean surroundings are characteristic, even essential. The assembly line, with the organization of armies of men, to carry out simple, routine functions, is an anachronism. Our symbols of technology must change before we can keep pace with changes in technology itself. We should never forget that technology feeds on itself. Technology makes more technology possible. In fact, technological innovation consists of three stages linked together in a self-reinforcing cycle. First, there is the creative stage, with the blueprint of a feasible idea. This is made real by its practical application, and this finally ends in its diffusion through society. The process is then complete, the loop is closed when the diffusion of technology embodying the new idea in its turn helps generate new creative ideas. Today, all over the developed world, the time gap between each of the steps in this cycle has been shortened. In India, we are just progressing towards that stage closing the loop. After the Gulf War concluded with the victory of the technologically superior allied forces, over 500 scientists of DRDL and RCI gathered to discuss issues that had emerged. I posed a question before the assembly, was technology or weapon symmetry with other nations feasible, and if so, should it be attempted? The discussion led to many more serious questions, such as, how to establish effective electronic warfare support. How to make missile development proceed apace with the development of equally necessary systems like the LCA, and what were the key areas where a push would bring progress. At the end of a lively discussion spread over three hours, the consensus emerged that there was no way to redress asymmetry in military capability except to have the same capability in specific areas as your potential opponent. The scientists vowed to achieve a reduced SEP in the accuracy of Prithvi's delivery, perfecting the Ka band guidance system for Trichel and realizing all carbon-carbon re-entry control surfaces for Agni by the end of the year. The vow was later fulfilled. The year also saw two blanched NAG flights, and the maneuver of Trichel at 7 meters above sea level, at speeds which exceeded three times the speed of sound. The latter was a breakthrough in the development of an indigenous ship-launched anti-sea skimmer missile. The same year, I received an honorary degree of Doctor of Science from the IIT, Bombay. In the citation read by Professor B. Nag on the occasion, 
I was described as an inspiration behind the creation of a solid technological base from which India's future aerospace programs can be launched to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Well, perhaps Professor Nag was only being polite, but I do believe that India will enter the next century with its own satellite in geostationary orbit 36,000 kilometers away in space, positioned by its own launch vehicle. India will also become a missile power. Ours is a country with tremendous vitality. Even though the world may not see its full potential or feel its full power, no one dare ignore it anymore. On October 15th, I turned 60. I looked forward to retirement and planned to open a school for the less privileged children. My friend, Professor P. Ramarao, who was heading the Department of Science and Technology in the Government of India, even struck up a partnership with me to establish what he called the Raukalam School. We were unanimous in our opinion that carrying out certain missions and reaching certain milestones, however important they may be or however impressive they might appear to be, is not all there is to life. But we had to postpone our plan as neither of us was relieved from our post by the government of India. It was during this period that I decided to put down my memoirs and express my observations and opinions on certain issues. The biggest problem Indian youth faced, I felt, was a lack of clarity of vision, a lack of direction. It was then that I decided to write about the circumstances and people who made me what I am today, the idea was not merely to pay tribute to some individuals or highlight certain aspects of my life. What I wanted to say was that no one, however poor, underprivileged or small, need feel disheartened about life. Problems are a part of life. Suffering is the essence of success. As someone said, God has not promised skies always blue, flower-strewn pathways all our life through, God has not promised sun without rain joy without sorrow, peace without pain. I will not be presumptuous enough to say that my life can be a role model for anybody, but some poor child living in an obscure place, in an underprivileged social setting may find a little solace in the way my destiny has been shaped. It could perhaps help such children liberate themselves from the bondage of their illusory backwardness and hopelessness. Irrespective of where they are right now, they should be aware that God is with them and when he is with them, who can be against them? But God has promised. Strength for the day. Rest for the labor. Light for the way. It has been my observation that most Indians suffer unnecessary misery all their lives because they do not know how to manage their emotions. They are paralyzed by some sort of a psychological inertia. Phrases like the next best alternative, the only feasible option or solution, and till things take a turn for the better are commonplace in our business conversations. Why not write about the deep-rooted character traits which manifest themselves in such widespread, self-defeatist thought patterns and negative behavior? I have worked with many people and organizations and have had to deal with people who were so full of their own limitations that they had no other way to prove their self-worth than by intimidating me. Why not write about the victimization which is a hallmark of the tragedy of Indian science and technology? And about the pathways to organizational success? Let the latent fire in the heart of every Indian acquire wings, and the glory of this great country light up the sky. Technology, unlike science, is a group activity. It is not based on individual intelligence, but on the interaction of many people. I think the biggest success of IGMEEP is not the fact that in record time the country acquired the capability of making five state-of-the-art missile systems but that through it, some superb teams of scientists and engineers have been created. If someone asks me about my personal achievements in Indian rocketry, I would put it down to having created a challenging environment for teams of young people to work in. In their formative stages, teams are much like children in spirit. They are as excitable, as full of vitality, enthusiasm, curiosity, and the desire to please and excel. As with children, however, these positive attributes can be destroyed by the behavior of misguided parents. For teams to be successful, the environment must offer scope for innovation. I confronted many such challenges during the course of my work at DTDNP, AIR, ISRO, DRDO, and elsewhere, 
but always ensured for my teams an environment which allowed innovation and risk-taking. When we first began creating project teams during the SLV3 project and later in IGMEAD, people working in these teams found themselves in the front line of their organization's ambitions. Since a great deal of psychological investment had been made in these teams, they became both highly visible and highly vulnerable. They were personally expected to make a disproportionate contribution to win collective glory. I was aware that any failure in the organizational support system would negate the investment in team strategies. The teams would be relegated to the league of average working groups and might fail even there, unable to meet the high expectations set for them. On several occasions, the organization was on the verge of losing its nerve and imposing restraints. The high level of uncertainty and complexity associated with team activity very often proves to be a trap for the unwary. In the early years of the SLV3 project, I often had to counter nervousness of the top people because progress was not tangibly or immediately visible. Many felt that the organization had lost control over SLV3, that the team would run on unchecked, and cause chaos and confusion. But on all occasions, these fears were proved imaginary. There were many people in powerful positions in organizations, for example at VSSC, who underestimated our responsibility and commitment to organizational objectives. Dealing with such people was a crucial part of the whole operation, and this was performed dexterously by Dr. Brahm Prakash. When you work as a project team, you need to develop a complex view of the success criteria. There are always multiple and often conflicting sets of expectations that exist about a team's performance. Then, quite often, the project teams are virtually torn apart in their attempt to accommodate the needs and constraints of subcontractors outside the organization and specialist departments within the organization. Good project teams are able to quickly identify the key person or people with whom negotiations must take place. A crucial aspect of the team leader's role is to negotiate with these key people for their requirements, and to ensure that the dialogue continues on a regular basis as the situation develops or changes. If there is one thing outsiders dislike, it is unpleasant surprises. Good teams ensure that there are none. The SLV3 team developed their own internal success criteria. We articulated our standards, expectations, and objectives. We summarized what was needed to happen for us to be successful and how we would measure success. For instance, how we were going to accomplish our tasks, who would do what and according to what standards, what were the time limits and how would the team conduct itself with reference to others in the organization. The process of arriving at the success criteria within a team is an intricate and skilled one because there are a lot of things going on below the surface. On the surface, the team is simply working to achieve the project's goals. But I have repeatedly seen how people are poor at articulating what they want until they see a work center doing something they don't want them to do. A project team member must in fact act like a detective. He should probe for clues as to how the project is proceeding, and then piece together different bits of evidence to build up a clear, comprehensive, and deep understanding of the project's requirements. At another level, the relationship between the project teams and the work centers should be encouraged and developed by the project leader. Both parties must be very clear in their minds about their mutual interdependence and the fact that both of them have a stake in the project. At yet another level, each side should assess the other's capabilities and identify areas of strength and weakness in order to plan what needs doing and how it should be done. In fact, the whole game can be seen as a process of contracting. It is about exploring and arriving at an agreement on what each party expects of the other, about realistically understanding the constraints of the other party, and about communicating the success criteria while defining some simple rules about how the relationship is to work, but above all, it's the best means of developing clarity in the relationship, both at the technical and personal levels, in order to avoid any nasty surprises in the future. In Igmeep, Shivathanupalai and his team did some remarkable work in this area through their homegrown technique, PACE, which stands for Program Analysis, Control, and Evaluation. Each day between 12 noon and 1 p.m., 
they would sit with a project team and a particular work center that was on the critical path. And assess the level of success among themselves. The excitement of planning ways to succeed and the vision of future success provide an irresistible form of motivation which, I have found, always makes things happen. The concept of technology management has its roots in the developmental management models which originated in the early 60s out of a conflict between harmony-seeking and output-oriented management structures. There are basically two types of management orientations, primal, which values an economic employee, and rational, which values an organizational employee. My concept of management is woven around an employee who is a technology person. While the primal management school recognizes people for their independence and rational management acknowledges them for their dependability, I value them for their interdependence. Whereas the primal manager champions independent enterprise and the rational manager serves cooperation, I moot interdependent joint ventures, getting the forces together, networking people, resources, time schedules, costs, and so on. Abraham Maslow was the first person to suggest the new psychology of self-actualization at a conceptual level. In Europe, Rudolf Steiner and Ray Gravans developed this concept into the system of individual learning and organizational renewal. The Anglo-German management philosopher, Fritz Schumacher introduced Buddhist economics and authored the concept of small is beautiful. In the Indian subcontinent, Mahatma Gandhi emphasized grassroot level technology and put the customer at the center of the entire business activity. J.R.D. Tata brought in progress-driven infrastructure. Dr. Homi Jahangir Babha and Professor Vikram Sarabhai launched the high, technology-based atomic energy and space programs with a clear-cut emphasis on the natural laws of totality and flow. Advancing the developmental philosophy of Dr. Babha and Professor Sarabhai, Dr. M. S. Vaminathan ushered the Green Revolution into India working on another natural principle of integrity. Dr. Verghese Kurian brought in a powerful cooperative movement through a revolution in the dairy industry. Professor Sudish Dhavan developed mission management concepts in space research. These are but a few examples of individuals who have not only articulated but also implemented their ideas, thus changing forever the face of research and business organizations all over the world. In the IGMEAD, I attempted to integrate the vision of Professor Sarabhai and the mission of Professor Dhavan by adapting the high technology setting of Dr. Brahm Prakash's space research. I attempted to add the natural law of latency in founding the Indian guided missile program in order to create a completely indigenous variety of technology management. Let me use a metaphor to illuminate this. The tree of technology management takes root only if there is the self-actualization of needs, renewal, interdependence, and natural flow. The growth patterns are characteristic of the evolution process, which means that things move in a combination of slow change and sudden transformation, each transformation causes either a leap into a new, more complex level or a devastating crash to some earlier level, dominant models reach a certain peak of success when they turn troublesome and the rate of change always accelerates. The stem of the tree is the molecular structure in which all actions are formative, all policies are normative, and all decisions are integrative. The branches of this tree are resources, assets, operations, and products which are nourished by the stem through a continuous performance evaluation and corrective update. This tree of technology management, if carefully tended, bears the fruits of an adaptive infrastructure, technological empowerment of the institutions, the generation of technical skills among people, and finally self-reliance of the nation and improvement in the quality of life of its citizenry. When IGMEAP was sanctioned in 1983, we did not have an adequate technology base. A few pockets of expertise were available, but we lacked the authority to utilize that expert technology. The multi-project environment of the program provided a challenge, four or five advanced missile systems had to be simultaneously developed. This demanded judicious sharing of resources, establishing priorities, and ongoing induction of manpower. Eventually, the IGMEAD had 78 partners, 
including 36 technology centers and 41 production centers spread over public sector undertakings, ordnance factories, private industries, and professional societies, hand-in-hand -hand with a well-knit bureaucratic structure in the government. In the management of the program, as much as in the technological inputs, we attempted to develop a model that was appropriate, even tailor-made, for our very specific needs and capabilities. We borrowed ideas that had been developed elsewhere, but adapted them in the light of what we knew were our strengths and what we recognized as the constraints we would be compelled to work under. All in all, the combination of appropriate management and our cooperative endeavors helped to unearth the talent and potential that lay unused in our research laboratories, government institutions, and private industries. The technology management philosophy of IGMEEP is not exclusive to missile development. It represents the national urge to succeed and an awareness that the world will never again be directed by muscle or money power. In fact, both these powers will depend on technological excellence. Technology respects only technology. And, as I said in the beginning, technology, unlike science, is a group activity. It does not grow only through individual intelligence, but by intelligences interacting and ceaselessly influencing one another. And that is what I tried to make Igmeet, a 78-strong Indian family which also makes missile systems. There has been much speculation and philosophizing about the life and times of our scientists, but not enough exploration in determining where they wanted to go and how they reached there. In sharing with you the story of my struggle to become a person, I have perhaps given you some insight into this journey. I hope it will help at least a few young people to stand up to the authoritarianism in our society. A characteristic feature of this social authoritarianism is its insidious ability to addict people to the endless pursuit of external rewards, wealth, prestige, position, promotion, approval of one's lifestyle by others, ceremonial honors, and status symbols of all kinds. To successfully pursue these goals, they have to learn elaborate rules of etiquette and familiarize themselves with customs, traditions, protocols, and so on. The youth of today must unlearn this self-defeating way of life. The culture of working only for material possessions and rewards must be discarded. When I see wealthy, powerful, and learned people struggling to be at peace with themselves, I remember people like Ahmet Jalaluddin and Iyadure Solomon. How happy they were with virtually no possessions. On the coast of Coromandel. Where the earthy shells blow. In the middle of the sands. Lived some really rich souls. One cotton lungi and half a candle, one old jug without a handle. These were all the worldly possessions of these kings in the middle of the sands. How did they feel so secure without anything to fall back upon? I believe they drew sustenance from within. They relied more on the inner signals and less on the external cues that I have mentioned above. Are you aware of your inner signals? Do you trust them? Have you taken control over your life into your own hands? Take this from me. The more decisions you can make avoiding external pressures, which will constantly try to manipulate you, the better your life will be, the better your society will become. In fact the entire nation will benefit by having strong, inward-looking people as their leaders. A citizenry that thinks for itself, a country of people who trust themselves as individuals, would be virtually immune to manipulation by any unscrupulous authority or vested interest. Your willingness to use your own inner resources to invest in your life, especially your imagination, will bring you success. When you address a task from your own uniquely individual standpoint, you become a whole person. Everyone on this planet is sent forth by him to cultivate all the creative potential within us and live at peace with our own choices. We differ in the way we make our choices and evolve our destiny. Life is a difficult game. You can win only by retaining your birthright to be a person. And to retain this right, you will have to be willing to take the social or external risks involved in ignoring pressures to do things the way others say they should be done. What will you call Shivasubramaniya Ayyar inviting me to have lunch in his kitchen? Zohara, my sister, 
mortgaging her gold bangles and chains to get me into engineering college. Professor Sponder insisting that I should sit with him in the front row for the group photograph, making a hovercraft in a motor garage setup. Sudhakar's courage. Dr. Brahm Prakash's support. Narayanan's management. Venkatraman's vision. Arunachalam's drive. Each is an example of a strong inner strength and initiative. As Pythagoras had said 25 centuries ago, above all things, reverence yourself. I am not a philosopher. I am only a man of technology. I spent all my life learning rocketry. But as I have worked with a very large cross-section of people in different organizations, I had an opportunity to understand the phenomenon of professional life in its bewildering complexity. When I look back upon what I have narrated so far, my own observations and conclusions appear as dogmatic utterances. My colleagues, associates, leaders, the complex science of rocketry, the important issues of technology management, all seem to have been dealt with in a perfunctory manner. The despair and happiness, the achievements and the failures differing markedly in context, time, and space all appear grouped together. When you look down from an aircraft, people, houses, rocks, fields, trees, all appear as one homogeneous landscape, it is very difficult to distinguish one from another. What you have just read is a similar bird's eye view of my life scene, as it were, from afar. My worthiness is all my doubt, his merit, all my fear, contrasting which my quality does however, appear. This is the story of the period ending with the first Agni launch life will go on. This great country will make enormous strides in all fields if we think like a united nation of 900 million people. My story the story of the son of Janyalabdin, who lived for over a hundred years on Mosque Street in Ramaswaram Island and died there, the story of a lad who sold newspapers to help his brother, the story of a pupil reared by Shivasubramni Yayayar and Iyadure Solomon, the story of a student taught by teachers like Pandalai, the story of an engineer spotted by M.G.K. Menon and groomed by the legendary Professor Sarabai, the story of a scientist tested by failures and setbacks, the story of a leader. Supported by a large team of brilliant and dedicated professionals. This story will end with me, for I have no belongings in the worldly sense. I have acquired nothing, built nothing, possess nothing no family, sons, daughters. I am a well in this great land. Looking at its millions of boys and girls to draw from me. The inexhaustible divinity. And spread his grace everywhere. As does the water drawn from a well. I do not wish to set myself up as an example to others, but I believe that a few readers may draw inspiration and come to experience that ultimate satisfaction which can only be found in the life of the spirit. God's providence is your inheritance. The bloodline of my great-grandfather of all, my grandfather Pakir, and my father Janyalabdin may end with Abdul Kalam, but his grace will never cease, for it is eternal. Epilogue this book is interwoven with my deep involvement with India's first satellite launch vehicle SLV-3 and Agni programs, an involvement which eventually led to my participation in the recent important national event related to the nuclear tests in May, 1998. I have had the great opportunity and honor of working with three scientific establishments space, defense research, and atomic energy. I found, while working in these establishments, that the best of human beings and the best of innovative minds were available in plenty. One feature common to all three establishments, is that the scientists and technologists were never afraid of failures during their missions. Failures contain within themselves the seeds of further learning which can lead to better technology, and eventually, to a high level of success. These people were also great dreamers and their dreams finally culminated in spectacular achievements. I feel that if we consider the combined technological strength of all these scientific institutions, it would certainly be comparable to the best found anywhere in the world. Above all, I have had the opportunity of working with the great visionaries of the nation, namely Professor Vikram Sarabhai, Professor Sudish Dhavan and Dr. Brahm Prakash, each of whom have greatly enriched my life.
a nation needs both economic prosperity and strong security for growth and development. Our self-reliance mission in Defense System 1995-2005 will provide the armed forces with a state-of-the-art competitive weapons system. The Technology Vision 2020 plan will put into place certain schemes and plans for the economic growth and prosperity of the nation. These two plans have evolved out of the nation's dreams. I earnestly hope and pray that the development resulting from these two plans self-reliance mission and technology vision 2020 will eventually make our country strong and prosperous and take our rightful place among the ranks of the developed nations.